thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you to the organization team uh, for putting up this great conference. It's really amazing. Um, it's my second time here and there's so many new faces, so I'm really glad to see everybody. Um, yeah, like um, I was introduced, my name is Aga. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm active with a group called Anti-Speciesist Women in the UK. And um, yeah, like it was said, I, I am kind of interested in feminist anti-speciesist activism. Um, today, this workshop is kind of designed to give you a few practical tips to take back to your own groups, um, to make them more inclusive and less oppressive, basically. Um, we'll start, uh, basically the first kind of half or three quarters of the workshop will uh, consist of me speaking a bit about my own experience and giving you a few tips that I found useful, lots of which I got last year at this conference actually. Um, so it's all quite new to me as well and I was just kind of hoping we could exchange uh, a few tools and, and yeah, make this an, a learning experience for all of us. Um, I'll start with uh, talking you through something called the Safer Space Agreement. Can I just get a show of hands who has heard of, of this term, Safer Space Agreement? Okay, so I see there's a few people who have no idea. Uh, so this is, this is quite good. Um, we can then kind of learn from each other. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, why, why we need to talk about total liberation, especially in the animal uh, liberation movement. Why, why is it not just about animals? Why do we need to uh, consider other human beings as well? Um, we'll then do a short exercise about, about privilege, so recognizing your own privilege in the movement and outside. And um, just, just a kind of disclaimer, so you don't need to participate in any of this. Um, don't feel like you need to uh, yeah, participate in the discussions or um, in any of the exercises. It's not, it's not compulsory, but you can still, I think, learn a lot. Um, the last thing I want to do, you've probably seen the posters around the room, so the very last thing will be um, just a kind of discussion where we share our own experiences as activists with uh, different systems of oppression. But don't worry, I'll get to that at the end. I'll explain a bit more. Okay, so this is, this is my name, Aga, and I'm with the Anti-Speciesist Women, like I said. Uh, yeah, the first thing uh, is that the Safer Space Agreement, which I kind of find um, very useful, uh, not just to give you kind of tips how to, how to write up a Safer Space Agreement for any meetings, for any gatherings, but also to use practically for, for, this, for this gathering in this room, for this space to make it as safe as possible and to make everybody feel welcome and comfortable. Um, this is basically um, a condensed version of the Safer Space Agreement that I use with my um, women's group. And uh, the first thing is um, we kind of agreed in, in our group, and I, I like to do this, to give a trigger warning because um, every time you mention some sort of content that might be upsetting, that might um, yeah, cause um, people who suffered from some sort of violence, from um, from any traumas might cause them to, to relive this moment and, and we don't want this, we want this to be a safe space, obviously. So the following guidelines that I'll talk you through are mentioning uh, violence and, and yeah, oppression, which, which some of you might have experienced and some of us um, will have gone through. Um, okay, so just the kind of first general clause uh, you can you know you can take this with you and write your own version of it whatever suits the group that you are in uh, we just kind of wrote that we want to make this meeting uh, as safe as possible for all people who are struggling uh, with and fighting oppression uh, to make the space as safe as possible we always uh, we try to always um, give trigger warnings when appropriate um, we learn when to give trigger warnings. So this, is, this might also be a very new concept for, for many people. Um, I've, I'm still learning to, to do that really. Um, we want to become aware of our own privilege. So again, if this is something totally new, don't worry. We're gonna kind of uh, learn about this today as well. Uh, we want to not make assumptions about others' experiences, identities, emotions. Uh, we want to abstain from apologism, victim blaming, gaslighting. 
So these are very um, yeah, feminist. Maybe if some of you are active in the feminist movement, you will have come across it. But I find, um, yeah, especially in the animal rights movement, I've never heard of it before until I uh, kind of branched out a bit. So um, apologism kind of refers to the idea that you apologize for someone who is being oppressive. Uh, so someone who's maybe violent or who did something wrong um, is being called out on it and um, instead of taking the kind of victim's side, you, you side with the, with the um, yeah, oppressor by saying, oh, you know, they didn't mean it or this won't happen again, instead of talking kind of constructively through it and um, yeah, c coming to a decision that um, lets, the, lets the victim of this oppression be comfortable again. Uh, victim blaming also very similar. So instead of um, instead of talking to to the oppressor, you um, talk at the victim. You you say actually probably it was it might have been your fault. You might have said something wrong. Um, you might have worn the wrong clothes, and this is why uh, this person was coming on to you so strong. And you know it's your own fault. Uh, this kind of mm, narrative. Uh, gaslighting is the idea that. Um, Maybe it's it's a bit more extreme than victim blaming. It goes as far as to tell uh, the victim of a, of of a violent act uh, that actually they are remembering it wrong. So you are creating a new reality, and you don't you don't um, allow the victim to um, yeah express their memory and to to um, yeah t retell the story from their point of view. Instead, you claim that they they must have made this up you know these these kind of things happen a lot and um, I just hope that we can all become more aware of this in in our own groups also if anything is unclear interrupt me uh, at any point I kind of want this to be interactive so is, is this okay so far I don't know maybe maybe you are already thinking oh yeah this happened to me or this happened to my friend or something like this so this is this is good and at the end we'll take take a moment to yeah to talk about these experiences on the posters and amongst each other um, yeah another thing that we are trying to do and this really needs to be explicitly stated uh, that we want to invite questions and not speak in absolute terms so we don't want to say this is the right way especially in a very varied uh, activist movement we want to invite lots of opportunities we want people to ask questions and this this is also valid for our own small meetings we want to um, yeah be create a dialogue basically and not uh, make absolute statements uh, we also then have a more kind of specific clause in there where we specifically say that we want to refrain from sexist, transphobic, binaristic, homophobic, biphobic, anti-asexual and anti-queer uh, expression. And now uh, this expression, um, I also, we, we have this in, in our agreement, I didn't put this on here, but basically by expression we mean um, any sort of any sort of statement you make, so this can be in speech, in writing, but this can also be your body language. So body language is very important in communication, and you can alienate a lot of people uh, by 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 your body language and just by by being um, oppressive. Uh, also, if if you don't mean it, but I'll get to that a bit later. So um, we want to refrain from racist, xenophobic, and culturally appropriative expressions. Um, we want to refrain from stereotyping, stereotyping religious identification. Uh, we want to refrain from ableist and disabled expression and from discriminating against the uh, disabled. Uh, so here you can see that we tried to accommodate um, all kind of terms uh, that um, the disabled community or disabled um, community um, uses to refer to themselves. So um, this is also another important thing to always keep in mind that um, yeah, people uh, people use different words, use a different language, they identify with a different language. So do try to accommodate that as well in your in your actions and in your writing. Mm. We want to refrain from ageist and classist, ex classist expression. We want to refrain from uh, fat shaming, slut shaming, and homophobia, which is 
this is happening a lot. This has to do uh, with sexism, obviously, and I noticed that a lot in, in the animal rights movement. Uh, you know, we've all probably been at demos or organized demos with um, naked women or, um, you know, we all have this PETA advert in mind, I think, with uh, women in salad bikinis or something. And, you know, we, we need to think about who we are inviting into the movement if we use these kind of tactics. Um, do we want people who are interested in women in bikinis uh, or do we want to invite animal rights activists who will actually do something against speciesism. Um, but also, obviously, it's a matter of taking care of each other in the movements. So uh, if, if you see that even in your private circles, um, this is happening, you know, this needs to be um, talked about and stopped. Um, this is just the last point about the Safer Space Agreement uh, before I come to some, some kind of more practical ideas. So we want to not make assumptions about people's pronouns. So like I said, my pronouns are uh, she and her. And um, if you meet somebody new, try to get into the, into the habit of asking them what are your pronouns instead of assuming, um, I don't know, by their looks or wh whatever your feeling is that uh, they belong to a certain uh, gender that they yeah, that they are this certain gender that you are perceiving. Um, yeah, this is also very important in all women's spaces. So um, if, if you have a w women's space, do also uh, come into the habit of asking for pronouns. Um, do not out people who identify on the Mogai um, spectrum. So this is the marginalized orientations, gender alignments, and intersex spectrum. Um, so do not do not out them, even if if they have come to you and said, uh, you know, I'm gay. Uh, don't don't just tell everybody about this. This is not not okay. And um, if they haven't agreed to that, you shouldn't do that. Um, same with someone who you know uh, is disabled or disabled um, or who has survived uh, some form of violence. Do not go around and tell everybody about it. Mm. And uh, the most important bit probably, or, or a very important bit, is if you see that someone is you know, brave enough and, and has the courage to actually say, oh, wait a minute, what you just did was really, made me feel very uncomfortable, or could you not use this language, or could you, could you not behave a certain way? If, if someone has the courage to say this to someone else, and you, you noticed that as well, do give them some confirmation. Do say, oh yeah, actually, I also noticed that, and maybe we can talk about it, maybe we can uh, work on it, or, you know, maybe, maybe this act was so, uh, horrible that there is no no way back and and you have to remove this person from your from your meetings from your circles that's also an option but always try to yeah help out um, the person who is kind of brave enough who has the courage to stand up and say wait a minute we need to talk about this even if you think this is taking time away from you know planning the next demo or or the next meeting or whatever important things you are doing we need to take care of ourselves before we can do these things because otherwise we won't be uh, a strong enough group so any behavior that could jeopardize the safety of anybody in the group um, needs to be talked about, needs to be called out or called in. Um, so there's a kind of slim difference between calling in and calling out. If you call somebody in, um, it's perhaps kind of more friendly and I prefer that, although I feel like that is much harder than to say, wait a minute, stop you know, stop being such an asshole, stop being uh, really oppressive. That's obviously the easier way, but we want, to, we want to foster a dialogue. And very often we don't notice that we are doing something that's oppressive, that is being uh, harmful to another person. And, you know, it's, it's not worth it to alienate everybody who's, who's doing um, something wrong that, that might, might um, be... Yeah, it might be kind of made right again. Right again, so we can um, talk about it and call someone in in a friendly way, in a more kind of open discussion way. So, just to give you some practical tips, uh, not not necessarily for an agreement that you have to write up. We we did. Um, 
like a written statement and every time we have someone new coming to the meeting we show them that uh, safer space agreement and they just sign it at the bottom um, you know of course um, it's then up to the group to actually enforce this mm, excuse me this this kind of rule the system of rules because um, it's like one thing to have this agreement and very often it happens that then somebody behaves oppressively as is really harmful and toxic but um, the, the organizers say, oh, you know, this, is, this can't be happening. We have this agreement in place. This is not how it works. You need to, you need to listen to the people who tell you that they feel, um, yeah, they feel harmed and they feel um, that someone is not, not kind of playing by the rules. Um, in practical terms, if you advertise an event, make sure you, you put kind of uh, diverse a group of people on the, on the picture, if you have a picture of people. Um, make sure your location is accessible. And now, you know, this is really ironic. I was, I was thinking <laughs> whether this is the best place to do this. Is obviously not, we can't, this place is not very accessible. We have these stairs right there. Um, I'm not sure if there are any gender neutral toilets, for example, uh, on, this, on this ground here. So these are all things to think about. And as soon as you, uh, start thinking about your next meeting. Try to try to organize it in a place that is wheelchair accessible, that has enough space uh, to move around in a wheelchair. Uh, try to make sure that there are gender neutral toilets. Try to, um, you know, and this is easily done. You could uh, put a, a little poster on, on top of the uh, male or female sign and just say gender neutral. And uh, yeah, this is just kind of practical uh, stuff that can be kind of remedied quickly. Um, yeah, and do always explicitly state, so um, don't expect that people who need gender neutral toilets, don't expect them to come to you and ask you for it. It's, you know, the, the thing is that they would rather not come because they don't want to jeopardize their safety. Uh, if, you, if you state on your whatever Facebook event or, or leaflet that, that there are gender neutral toilets, that will invite more people immediately. <coughs> Um, another option to kind of enforce the safer space agreement is to, ha to have security people. So I've, ne I've never done this before, but I've heard from other activists that um, when, when they kind of gathered at a, at a big gathering like this, uh, they wanted to have a small kind of safe group. And um, they noticed that there was a lot of kind of harassment they were getting, and they took uh, two women actually to to kind of guard guard the place and they noticed that uh, having two women in place uh, already kind of solves the problem uh, instead of putting two men as security people um, not sure why that is but you know there's lots of kind of space to explore that in your own groups mm. At the end of the meetings, uh, this is something I'm doing as well. Uh, we usually have a roundup where people can say anything that either was not on, on the agenda, that has nothing to do with uh, the next demo or whatever you are planning. And um, they can just say anything that they maybe disliked about the meeting, that they want changing, or something nice that, that you know happened in the meeting and that they wanted to draw attention to. Or just anything that they didn't get to say. So you know, there is always someone who's a bit quieter at a meeting. Um, so this is usually the chance for them to to um, just feel comfortable to express anything. It's a very useful thing to do. Um, yeah, just like I said, um, if someone if someone has the courage to um, to call somebody in or out, um, do support them, do support their concerns, and and this is easily done by just saying, you know, I'm glad you mentioned this. Uh, oh yeah, I noticed that as well. And oh, you know, if if this is not something you want to do, if you don't want to actually voice this, you can just kind of nod and and or smile at them, or you know, I don't know, touch their shoulder if that's okay with them. Um, yeah, just just kind of show your uh, support in that because it's it is really really scary. I don't know how many of you have had experience with this, but it's yeah, it's a very um, yeah scary situation. Mm. And very often, you know, it happens that you say something that might have been offensive, and if if you are if your attention is being drawn to it, just 
apologize for it and and say I'm you know I'm really sorry and this won't happen again and then do make sure that this doesn't happen again and um, if it's really you know if if you there will be situations where maybe not not you you lot here but I've had people in my group who who yeah needed to be removed or um, needed to be blocked from Facebook pages um, so this is all you know, something that you can discuss in the group. Um, I don't think anybody should take sole power over a group, but, but make sure that you hear the people who, who have been harmed and uh, who need um, yeah, to be safe again. Okay, so are there any questions about the safer space agreement so far? Do you, do you all find this kind of useful? Did you kind of, did that resonate with you? Okay, good. I'm glad. Um, yeah, like I said, this kind of all came about um, last year for me, so so it's also still quite new for me. So I, I will be quite happy to hear what others uh, have to suggest as well. Mm. Okay, then let's talk about total liberation. Um, I'll first start by explaining uh, this term kiriaki. So I, th I think it's very important that we kind of... Uh, yeah, use language um, in a very progressive way as well. And um, I like learning new words and, and applying them in my activism. Mm. So kiriaki is a term that was called by Elisabeth Schüssler Fiorenza in 1992. And it basically is a combination of the ancient Greek terms kyrios and akko. So uh, it's, it describes the the rule or the reign of, of a master, of a lord, so someone who's kind of, you know, hierarchically above you, who, um, who gives you the rules, who tells you what's right, what's wrong, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. And um, it's usually a kind of sovereign soul uh, being that has all the power. Um, and although I kind of refer to the safer space agreement as rules or guidelines, um, I think it's the difference is that if you set uh, if you set up a group and you decide on those rules together, if you don't just give people these rules, then um, you know it's it's very different than to mm, have somebody tell you, yeah, what's right, what's wrong. <coughs> Um, so kiriaki is used as an umbrella term for uh, all kind of systems of oppression. Um, it, it refers to any kind of rule over others. Um, it encompasses all forms of oppression, and um, these, yeah, these systems of oppression are basically. Obviously, they are all very different. So racism and speciesism are very different, and and. Um, they they create different forms of of violence, but um, what kind of all kiriakal uh, systems of oppression have in common is that they create an object. Uh, so the subject uh, position is occupied by this by this master, lord, king uh, figure. So any anyone who's kind of um, trying to tell you what to do to be above you. Um, and they create uh, the object who is then oppressed. So the object is something, it's something, it's not someone, right? So we, we are talking about this idea of dehumanizing. De um, we are talking about an idea of exchanging an object. So an object is something that um, can be used as a currency, for example. And this currency then defines the worth of, of the kiriak, of the kiriakal subject. Um, Maybe I hope this will become clearer a bit later when we talk about privilege in a, in a minute, actually. Um, and my kind of point is just that uh, I find this term kiriaki very useful, which, which actually has nothing to do with speciesism. I came across it um, uh, in my research, but um, this... Yeah, this term was, I think, coined to refer to a critical, a critical analysis of the Bible, I think. So it's totally not in my field, but I just came across it and I, I thought it really represents that we cannot, uh, as animal activists, we cannot just fight for um, animals without kind of yeah, supporting each other as humans, without, being, without standing in solidarity, right? So um, if, if we don't... Uh, stand in solidarity with each other, uh, we will be 
less useful to the animals and um, we will keep reproducing this violence, this um, privilege that we uh, as humans have. Uh, yeah, so this is just an example. Um, if we use the term patriarchy, for example, we, we just refer to the rule of men over women, right? So um, white supremacy, for example, is not included in that idea, or um, pastoralism or speciesism as the idea of humans ruling over animals is also not included. Um, and I think this was the idea of kiriaki, a term that defines all of these things together. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, and just to kind of make clear, make a bit clearer what, um, why this idea of total liberation uh, needs to be talked about um, and, and why humans are important to, to the animal rights movement. Um, so when we talk about kiriaki, we also need to talk about yeah, identity, identity dimensions. So we, all, uh, we are all um, ourselves, um, kind of made up of different identity dimensions, right? Um, I have a few kind of ideas of what, what these identity dimensions are. So for example, your name um, says a lot about, about you to other people. Uh, your socioeconomic background, your, your class, uh, your gender, species, uh, religious affiliation, the way you look, your appearance, your body language. Uh, the culture um, that you live, uh, the education you've had or you're having or you're giving, um, the race you uh, identify with, the citizen status you identify with, um, your sexual orientation, uh, the language you speak or the languages you speak, the dialect, the accent, uh, it all says a lot about you. and. Um, yeah, you, you, you can use, you use these things to express yourself, right? Your ethnicity is another one. So you can see that there's a lot of things. This is obviously not an exhausted list. There's many, many more things that make us up and, and that uh, define us. And um, yeah, so maybe some of you have heard of this idea of intersectionality. Um, it was coined Oh, sorry. It was coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw in the top right corner uh, in 1989. And um, this term is specifically coined to, um, yeah, to refer to the, to, the, to the intersection between class, race, and gender. Um, Crenshaw, basically, she, I think she's a lawyer, um, and she uh, noticed in the American law that there is no, you know, no option for uh, a woman of color uh, who is working class to um, file a complaint uh, based on based on her her being. Instead, she was fragmented um, in in front of the court into either uh, being um, sexually objectified or being racially objectified or a bit based on her I don't know employment status for example so there was no option to um, to be a whole person in front of the court if that makes sense um, now this idea um, is very useful I like to explain this idea of interconnectedness between uh, our identity dimensions with this idea but uh, it's really important as well that um, I myself as a white uh, feminist I will not kind of I don't want to appropriate this term so I really like to just use this um, for for the idea of the intersection between class race and gender uh, and not apply it to I don't know speciesism and uh, gender. So a female cow, we could say, uh, suffers from intersectionality, not, not just because she doesn't belong to the human species, so she's, she's a cow, but she also is a woman. Um, you know, this is the idea of intersectionality, but um, I'd rather use the word uh, interconnectedness. I don't know, it's, I guess it's um, debatable and we can, we can talk about this a bit more. Um, okay, so now let's talk about privilege, which also kind of goes um, hand in hand with the idea of identity dimensions. Uh, this is maybe a bit small. Oh, and, and it also, <laughs> sorry about that. So the blue line, um, 
was supposed to go through the middle, obviously. Uh, and this is a circle that is taken. It's, it's uh, kind of adapted from um, Catherine Pauli Morgan, who um, uh, devised a similar uh, kind of circle. And um, the top axis basically uh, has all the, or some identity dimensions that uh, represent the dominant culture, that represent um, the privileged um, identity dimensions, whereas the bottom ones are the kind of more oppressed identity dimensions. Mm, this is very simplistic, and this is just the very first introduction to privilege, so if some of you already have a better idea of it, uh, this will look a bit funny to you and a bit simplistic, but uh, I think it's a fair uh, starting point for us all to kind of depart from. So, for example, um, we have the white masculine male uh, in, the, in the dominant section, right? Um, and then at the bottom, uh, we have LGBTQ folk, we have uh, people of color, and at the same time, we also have uh, animals and plants. Uh, so these are these are um, on the speciesist line that I was kind of trying to draw uh, there, but something happened with the formatting. So this is just to give you a kind of first idea of what privilege is, and then uh, as a next thing, I would like to um, do a little exercise with you. Let me just open that. So the so the idea is the idea is that we um, go through a, through a few statements. Uh, basically, I'll read them out, but they'll also pop up on the screen. And um, if this statement applies to you, if you if you say, "Oh yeah, that's that's me," I, I think generally. Okay, generally, because <laughs> when I do this exercise, people always have a million questions. How, how did you mean this? How did you mean this? Just, just go with your gut feeling. If you think this applies to you, then just raise your hand. And again, so if you, if you don't want to participate, this is also fine. Um, um, I, I think everybody will stay seated, so I think we don't need to turn off the camera because it's just pointing to me or... Yeah, would you like to, shall we switch off the camera for now? Who, who would prefer that? Is that okay? I think it I, I'll show you now. So, um, we, we, I'll, read, uh, I'll read your statement, you will see the statement on screen. If you feel this generally applies to you, if you say, yeah, in most situations in my life, this is me, then just raise your hand. And you'll notice quickly that this is about um, yeah, noticing your own privilege because I think um, everybody will react a bit differently and uh, usually we are kind of surprised that we are not, or we are the only ones or we are not the only ones who mm, feel a certain way. D does that make sense for now? Or? Okay, so yeah, before we, uh, before we do this, I just want to give a quick uh, trigger warning because um, this workshop is kind of designed uh, to aim at lots of different forms of violence, so uh, there will be mention of uh, violence towards women, violence towards uh, people of color, uh, so just, just be aware, feel free um, to leave if you need to for um, maybe 10 minutes, and uh, if not, just you know, stay seated if you, if you want, um, if you need anything, just let me know. Okay, so just, yeah, just raise your arm if you think that um, this applies to you. Uh, one more thing, perhaps, uh, which you might find useful. Uh, privilege is generally uh, defined as um, the unearned benefit. So, so it's just given. It's, it's not something that you work for. It's an unearned benefit that we receive in society by the nature of our identity. So by the, all, the, all these dimensions that we talked about just, just now, but also by the nature of the system that we find ourselves in, right? So you will probably find that uh, this place here is very different to the, to the outside world. We, we can behave very differently here than uh, I don't know, when we go off to work or to school or um, just in our general lives. So it's always a kind of combination between your own identity and the system that you're in. 
Okay, so the first, the first sentence, if you feel that this is you, just raise your arm. Uh, I have access to clean water and sanitary facilities whenever I want to, whenever I need to. And, you know, feel free to have a look around the room um, just to kind of see um, how you feel about that. I have access to heating or air conditioning so as not to freeze or die from heat stroke. Generally, it's a bit cold at the campground if you've uh, <laughs> been there. I have a mobile phone to use in emergencies and keep in touch with others. Uh, English is my first language. So there you go. When I walk, uh, when I walk alone at night, I rarely or never feel suspicious, unsafe, anxious, or frightened. I have never thought of being or, or been scared of being uh, sexually assaulted or raped. I've never t been told that my mood is a result of my bodily cycle. <laughs> oh. That's a thing that happens quite a lot. I rarely question how attractive I am. I've never felt too emotional to be taken seriously. I never feel dismissed or taken or not taken seriously due to my age. Uh, when in a romantic relationship, I don't ever hesitate to mention my partner's gender. I am able to determine autonomously whether and when to have children. I never think about whether a building or room will be accessible or will provide the facilities I need. I rarely or never find myself in a room where I am the only representative of one of my identity dimensions or kind of generally speaking of, of your identity dimensions. Uh, when I flick through TV channels, I see a re reflection of my identity dimensions. I can be pretty sure that if I ask for the person in charge, uh, it will turn out to be somebody who identifies with the same racial identity I do. Uh, sorry, can you slow down a little bit? Oh, s of course, sorry. Okay, um, I'll also make sure to, to put this on the event page on Facebook and if you, if you want my email or something, this is just a public thing, I made this public so you can do this with your families or friends or something. Uh, without much hassle, I can walk into any supermarket and find the staple food of my culture. So generally speaking, when you're at home, Uh, I can walk into any hairdressing salon and be sure that, that the hairdressers learned how to treat my hair. Mm, my species membership guarantees that I will not be hunted. My species ensures that I will not be ripped from my uh, family and transported to a life behind bars uh, where I will be either experimented on or exposed for visitors. My species ensures that I will not be murdered for food or clothes and the list is endless, I think. Um, this, this is very useful because I do this exercise with people who have n never heard of anti-speciesism or, or they don't know that there is such a thing. So. Um, I think this is kind of the first step where they, where they uh, have a little aha moment. I have never felt that members of my community are unwanted or hated by the dominant culture. Sh shall I repeat? I don't know if it's very legible. I can see people squinting. Um, I guess the, the people you identify with, so your identity dimensions um, and the people that share the same ones, perhaps? Yeah, is that what everybody thought when I read that? 
for, yeah, for example, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I think there, there is actually a lot of uh, discrimination and violence against uh, people who speak up for animals or, or who, you know, just order a vegan burger. It's also possible. Uh, most public holidays, so wherever you live, most public holidays reflect dates that are significant to my culture, which means that I don't have to attend school or work on days that are important to me or my family. I rarely or never question whether I have been invited to an event, promoted in a job, or given a place to study uh, due to the nature of, of my identity dimensions. So this is, for example, uh, the token person of color or the token woman in a panel. Uh, so I don't know if, if any of you have experienced this or if you question yourself. Um, yeah, just show of hands quickly. Okay, so this, this was kind of, yeah, for some of you, a first introduction to the idea of privilege. So if you've, if you've raised your hand a lot, you, you know, you are kind of theoretically very, very privileged. You uh, move around as a, as a very dominant person. And uh, the idea is now that you kind of know what, what um, yeah, the, for example, not everybody feels safe on the street at night. Um, you can pay more attention to um, the way that you perhaps make other people feel on the street, or um, just, just any of these examples. Does that make sense? Are we all happy with that? So thank you very much. Thank you.